All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming to the talk, how to talk to executives. Um, we've had a few changes. So before I get started, uh, can I ask everyone that's on a table that has like those, those feedback uh, forms to get, just get the red one that says this talk didn't meet my expectation and just hold it up for me? Because I, I, I just want to get this awkward part of the way because this talk is not going to meet your expectations because I was supposed to do this with uh, Jordi, uh, a fellow consultant, and uh, he had a family emergency. So, so he's not coming um, because indeed you're not, you're not Jordi. So instead of two consultants on stage talking about how to talk to executives, I, I went out and caught one. <laughs> so can I get a big applause for my savior, Colleen? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. All right, so now we start at the bottom, so you know, can only go can only go up from here. So a uh, little bit about me. My name is Will uh, Will Sela. It's a very very German name. That's because I'm Dutch. Um, I'm a, I'm a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. I'm a professional Kanban trainer with ProKanban.org, which is Colleen's my executive. Um, and uh, I also run my own consultancy business, Brazilians, which uh, allows me to give myself my own titles, which is why on the side you see anti-fragilist, because I thought that sounded cool. Um, and I'm here to talk about, well, the terrible mistakes I've made in the past trying to talk to executives and, and hopefully prevent you from falling into some of the traps that I've fallen in and give you three amazing tips uh, for how to make sure you don't tank your next meeting. Um, and so, well, I've already, I've already told a little bit about you and you've been on stage earlier today, but yeah. just one more time, tell the crowd something interesting. Um, well, let's see. I, um, I started out in software about 20 years ago, mm -hmm. which seems crazy, um, and then became a founder and a CEO of Scatterspoke, which is an online tool for retrospectives. Um, I founded that company with my husband, so our dinner table conversations are super boring, and our kids hate it. They refer to everything as Uncle Scatterspoke. So if we go out and we have a business conversation, they say, can Uncle Scatterspoke pay? <laughs> Is this an Uncle Scatterspoke trip? Um, and then joined Pro Kanban as CEO um, about two years ago. And so we've been working on building out our, our community and our offering around that. All right. So. Uh, as all good talks go, and oh, I really hope this is going to be one of them, but I'll leave that up to you. Um, let me start with a bit of a story. So a few years ago, I was called into a major not-to-be-named German automotive company uh, to do an audit of a project that had gone uh, a little bit overboard. So um, just, just to illustrate, after three years of development and several millions of euros spent, they went live with a product that um, failed in such a spectacular way that they ended up having to pay twice the development costs and fees to the partners that they rolled it out to. Um, and so in that light, I was brought in because they had used Scrum and they wanted to have a second opinion uh, to see, well, what went wrong here? Uh, and, and what can we learn from it? Now, that is, a, that is a whole separate talk on everything that went wrong there, but I ended up producing, producing an audit uh, that said, well, there were mistakes made in terms of software quality and in terms of team management, but ultimately the whole thing was doomed to fail from the start because the accountabilities weren't set up in such a way that anyone actually owned this project. Familiar story, right? Um, and this made its way up the food chain uh, as it does, and I was invited to uh, talk a little bit about that report and explain a little bit about it with the CIO of the company. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how that conversation went. Um, right, so I, I get into the room, it's me, it's the chief architect uh, of the company, and it's the CIO, and he says, well, explain to me what went wrong. And I go off on this story about how uh, different accountabilities for different parts of product management and architecture and realization and partner management weren't covered and how, a, and, and you know, he kind of gets and he asks, well, what should I do? And I, and I said, well, you need a kind of a value stream different approach in your organizational setup. And he looks at me funny and he says, and I'm, this was, uh, we were having a conversation in Dutch, so I'll say it in a Dutch accent. He says, Will, uh, the problem is, uh, that uh, your report uh, and what you're telling me right now, um, well, my company is here and I am over here and you are talking here. I'm not following a word of what you're saying. 
what do I need to do? And I just go like, uh, well, you should go down and talk to these people more often because one thing that I found in my interviews with them is that every developer knew it was going to be a train crash when it went live. And he goes, well, how come none of them told it to me? And it's reflecting back on that conversation, there were three things that really stood out to me um, about the environment that an executive is in. All right, and these are the three, three things that I want you to keep in mind. The first thing is, they are always one or two bad outcomes away from losing their job in a very, very public way. The reason I was there wasn't because of what could be learned from the project or what could be improved. The reason was there was because the company had to do a multi-million euro write-off on something that had failed, where my report says I couldn't point to anyone but the, CEO, uh, the CIO as someone that had accountability over this whole thing. The second thing I learned is that, well, they don't know either. Right? My assumption in that conversation was this person knows way more than I do because he's a CIO. And he corrected me on that quite early in that conversation. Um, and the, the third thing I learned there is it's a very lonely job as an executive because the power disparity and the career uh, ambitions that people have mean that you very often can't trust what is being said to you. And this is sometimes the case in small companies. It's definitely the case in big companies. Now, what I'm going to do at the end of this talk is I'll give you three things that you can start doing to help you get out of that. But these were, these were my thoughts. And this is kind of what I've seen echoed in my talks with executives since. And what I thought would be interesting is to kind of look at this from your perspective, Colleen. So do you, do you recognize what I, what I observed or how does this, how does this reflect on your, uh, the way you do business? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's really interesting. You, everything you said is very true. And I think when the further away you are from, from everybody that's doing the work, the harder it is to know what's happening. Um, and I think some of that is you don't know what to ask for. You don't know what you know. You don't know the questions that need to be asked in the right moment. But then there is a part of it of like developers don't want to tell me if we're going to miss a release because they don't want to lose their job, right? So there's this sense of fear too. I think when you're looking up the chain at, at leadership and what you tell them, um, feeling like it's going to jeopardize your job or your role in an organization too. So I you do end up being very out of the fray of communication, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when so much of, of what we're trying to do from an agile perspective is focus on short, quick feedback loops. I mean, that gets, that gets lost, if not just longer and longer and longer when you're in a leadership role. And so I think that, you know, that falls apart pretty quickly for a lot of leaders because they don't have anything in place to talk to the people doing the work anymore. Yeah, and that, 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 was, that was one of my takeaways. So for, for people like like me, and I think for a lot of you, and for you as well, given, uh, given that you're in an agile company, right? The decisions we make are easy to fix, right? We can, we can say things like fail fast. Um, and I think uh, there's, there's this, there's this uh, report from Amazon, right? On type one and type two decisions. Type one decisions are the very impactful ones that you can't walk away from. And the type two decisions are ones where, well, if you're wrong, you just reverse them. And the reality in many, many organizations and what they teach you in a lot of management schools is that the majority of the decisions that you make as an executive, you have to approach them as those type one decisions. They're big, they're impactful, and they can't be reversed. And even when that stops being an actual reality, that can very often still be an emotional reality where you still see every decision you make as highly impactful and very, very risky, right? And if you don't, talk about that, if you don't talk about that emotional reality, you risk being a very dangerous person, right, in that, in that conversation. When I start talking about, oh, we should do more things and fail quickly, they're, they're all hearing like, no, no, please, please don't. 
So how did you how did you conquer that? Or is that something that you had to conquer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting the way you said it too. Of like the 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 impact of being wrong at that level is much more severe, right? And and that can be public. That can be the, the for the whole organization, not just for people in a leadership role. Um, and I think this translates a lot really into like product decisions, market decisions um, that can, you know, you're doing the best you can with the information you have available to you. But um, there's an absolute, there's absolutely a fear that you're going to make the wrong decision and that it's going to impact your whole business. Um, I think it becomes really critical in a lot of these situations to practice what we preach here and try to figure out what's the smallest way to fail. Right? How do we put the smallest thing out there where we can get feedback quickly and hopefully your business doesn't take it as a process. With, um, you know, with Scatterspoke, we've gone through a few different versions um, of, of this exact kind of decision-making process that's really hard to do. We had launched the tool as a completely free version of a, of a retro tool and over the years and trying to sell into corporate, you know, large corporations, we switched back to having single sign-on and different offerings that, you know, the security measures that large companies need to have that required us to switch to accounts. Um, and so that decision was a scary one because we were cutting, you know, cutting off all this free access to the board. Um, and as you would expect, a lot of people were pissed. So a lot of people wrote in to tell us what a terrible decision it was and how they weren't going to use our tool anymore. And, um, and now it's like every time we approach another big change like that that's going to impact our users or our customers, we have to look at it from the perspective of what's the smallest thing we can do here to figure out um, how we can test a little bit of this. And, and if we fail, and, and we do all the time, but if we fail, um, how will we learn from it and how can we fold that in quickly and make another decision? Um, and you'll see that, even, like I was telling Will, we just had to release the one out last night to reinst reinstitute free plans for up to 15 users. So we went full circle over the course of a couple of years there and it is scary you know and and you're you're in you're trying to do the best thing for your company and for your users and for your business i mean there's there's a business here that we're running too so all of those decisions kind of trickle back up to the person making that call and um, i think trying to figure out how you can create that culture of learning and doing things as small as possible really becomes critical at this level yeah absolutely and that is that is something that you have to very explicitly discuss kind of over and over again of, hey, this is something that is that is real and you have to demonstrate it, not just with teams, but also with things that you do together to kind of get that, to kind of get them to realize that, hey, you know, there's a, the reality has changed and my emotions about that reality can change along with it, right? So that, that would be the first big thing I want to, I want to give to you is to, you know, that, that circumstance of always being a bad decision away from disaster, right? And for a small company, that is disaster can be, well, the company fails or, um, you know, or we might lose customers. But if you're, if you're a big company, right, really messing up, really having a bad outcome can destroy your career for a few years even. You lose it in a very, very public way. So just talking about about doing faster things isn't going to get you there. It's it's demonstrating that hey, smaller decisions have lower impacts and they are safer to make, right? And that allows and that allows action. And we want to we want to give attention to that. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is something that the CEO in my uh, story didn't suffer from, right? Because he was very open of well, you know, my company's here, I'm over here, you're over here, um, but that is that imposter syndrome that is very rampant at that level. And partially it's because of the title, right? It's a really big title, you're chief of, chief of something, but it's also just the environment because they kind of all suffer from, from kind of one big thing and that is, see, that. <laughs> right, it's that automatic response. Everyone assumes that you know the most, that you're better, that you are where you are because you understand this subject matter like no one else. And that's just not reality, right? Often their skills are very, they're very different and you get there by happenstance and, and the world changes, but actually admitting and saying, well, hey, I, I don't know this stuff, that is really hard to do, right? Um, of course, you being open as you are <laughs> never, never happened to you, but you might, have, you might have some examples. Yeah, no, I think there's kind of two parts of this. I mean, I think the first is, I think, the best executives surround themselves with a lot of smart people, but 
um, you have to create open channels of communication so that you can hear those hard things. Um, in your example and in, in, in examples from either coaching or being in an executive seat, um, you want that bad news quickly and you want to be able to understand what's going on in the organization. And a lot of times that fear, that um, buffer between leaders and, and people doing the work creates uh, a void of, of information coming, right? And so it's, you don't know to ask the right questions. And by the time you find out the information, it's taken too long to respond to it. Um, I think we see this most frequently with like customer complaints, right? Large customer complaints will come in and nobody wants to tell you that the decision or the direction you made um, was the wrong one. And so they sit on it until 50 customers have complained and now it's a much bigger problem. So we see that a lot with you know small small enhancements that we've made. And we should all in our back pocket have a process to fix that, right? And it's like, we're having conversations at the team level to have retros all the time, but where is that going? And so um, we've tried really hard to make sure that we have reviews on a regular basis of what the teams are talking about, not verbatim, I'm not creeping on their retro, their retro post-its, but I'm trying to understand like what things are they struggling with, what feedback are they getting, what do they need to be successful or what's preventing them from feeling successful in their roles from a delivery perspective and um, how can I help enable that more? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in that position, if you're having those conversations, be really careful with the assumptions you make and, and especially try to avoid using your own jargon, right? Which, which we in the agile and lean world can be very, very guilty of. Um, and so that requires a little bit of self-awareness. The, the, the other part that makes this even harder is that many of us also suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, Right. Let's let's be honest. We have many many of us in the agile coaching business kind of have joke jobs. Right. We come in and we just point out very very obvious things like, hey, have you talked to each other? Should you have produced something? Right. Is somewhere in the back of our head we have that thing of, oh God, someone's gonna figure out that I'm just saying really obvious things and they won't pay me anymore. So especially when you talk to someone really high up the food chain, right? We have this tendency to overcompensate. Right? I've, I've definitely been in meetings where you know, the, the, the higher ranked person was in there, the more jargon was thrown at them. Like, oh, we need to do a management 3.0 sociocratic holacracy with, <laughs> you know, you don't even know what you're saying anymore. <laughs> All right. so, so it's really about, about not making that assumption and meeting people where they are, right? And it sounds so obvious, right? That's my own imposter syndrome uh, speaking here of talk to them in a language that they understand. Mm -hmm. And the best way to figure out what language they understand is, well, have that open conversation, have them explain the problem to you in their words, right? Understand yeah. the problem that they're experiencing. Yeah, and I think you can do that, you know, just like we all learn in different ways, trying to tap into maybe coming at somebody with a bunch of information, even if you're, you know, not using a lot of technical jargon, coming at them with a presentation or a meeting or a room full of people might put them in a defensive position, right? So like, I prefer to always have a little bit of information that I can consume offline before going into some of those conversations so I can get my bearings, whether it's articles or books. Um, especially from a technical perspective, so that I feel like I can have a better conversation. I can do a little research on my own. So that's one of the things I usually look for of like, let me prep a little before you're going to tell me a bunch of bad news. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the last thing, and, and that's kind of tapping into that last question that he asked me. Remember in the really bad Dutch accent, the, why didn't anyone tell me about this? Well, power does weird things to people, right? Having, having a title creates a barrier between people. Um, having a say about someone else's career creates a barrier between them. So um, it, it is very lonely to be up there. I've, 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 I've had sessions with people where they express that they feel that they can't trust anything that's being brought to them, that they can't trust the numbers because they fear they've been massaged, they fear they're only getting good news. And so, in that situation where he asked me that question, my response was, it's because you have a pervasive culture of fear in your company. <laughs> Keep in mind, this was 15 minutes into our first conversation. <laughs> right? Why on earth would I, would I do that? Right? And that's, that's the point three, is you have to be someone that speaks truth, that they can feel they can trust. And the best way you can get someone in that position to trust you is to tell them something they don't want to hear. 
right? And them not killing you for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so have you, have you experienced that loneliness? How do you? Yeah, I, well, I think a big part of it is finding the right level, right? I'm, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. And so as our, on the scatter spoke side and on pro Kanban side, as both organizations have grown, grown, I think you have to find the right places where you, where you're having a business conversation or a personal conversation, right? And what that looks like in kind of a different context. So um, I was asked more politely than what Will said to um, leave a few meetings with our development teams because um, no one would talk. And I was pushing, you know, I was trying to pull all these agile tools out to try to get everybody talking. And the feedback was, you're not the right person to do this. Like no one's talking because of the role that you're in and it's freaking everybody out. They don't want to say the right thing. They think you have, or the wrong thing. They think you have all the answers. And so they don't want to shoot, you know, throw something out here and have you say no. And so um, I think a lot of it is figuring out how, okay, in those places, I need to step out of their way and let that information come to me in a different channel, even though I want to participate, I want to get to know everyone. Um, and so what that means is that second half has to happen in a different way, right? So lunches, um, trying to get people to play games on Zoom, right? Doing some of that stuff so that I'm not scary, hopefully, or too scary, um, and getting to know them in a personal way, but also making sure that um, I'm not stepping on the opportunity for them to work together because I'm in inhibiting the conversations in some way. Absolutely. So, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of summarizing at this point. So the the three things that we talked about, right, is, um, right, emotionally they feel as though everything they do has a really, really big impact. And in traditional organizational setups with very long delivery cycles, right, this is truth. Um, and so we can change part of that organization um, but that won't change their emotions. But on the other hand, when you tap into that why, when you tap into those emotions and say, hey, you know, agility or lean or shorter development cycles or more frequent inspection and adaptation can lower that emotional burden, can give you more freedom to act without that blowback being immense, can turn someone into a really big supporter of what you're doing because now it resonates with what they feel, right? Whereas our assumption very often is we need to go at them from a business perspective, right? But people are emotional beings first before they are rational, economical beings. Very true. Right. And that allows you to build, to build that connection of, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you at an emotional level. I'm open about that imposter syndrome, and this might require opening up from your end, but also creating that space where it is okay to ask questions, right? Where you don't throw jargon, where you don't kind of re reinforce that existing feeling of, oh, I need to understand everything or I'm failing at my job, right? To stop being a threat is the, mo is, is, is the important thing. And the last thing is you want to be that voice of truth. You want to be someone that they can trust at face value. And honestly, from what I found, the easiest way to do that is to be the bearer of bad news. Oh, I thought you were going to say to be Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of. Uh, but I've, I've, I've done that. I've had meetings where, where, where I've come in and they just ask me, well, what should I know about my organization? And I'll say something really bad and then I'll not hear from them for two months. Yeah. And then they come, and then they come back and they're like, oh, I did my own research and... Yeah, you may have had a point there, right? And that's uncomfortable because that challenges us because we too suffer from that need to only give good news. Right? Um, so that is what I hope you'll you'll walk away from with those with those three three tips. And and how did I do, Colleen? Would you would you like me to help coach you? No, I don't, I'm not so sure yet, but no, absolutely. And I think exactly what you said, right? That that. Being the bearer of bad news does end up building trust over time, and I think it's kind of a two-way street. I think in a leadership role, you also have to be willing to share some bad news from time to time um, to kind of make that culture of, okay, we're going to get everything out on the table so we can talk about it and move through that um, instead of trying to keep keep the bad news out of, out of everybody's way. Because at the end of the day, that's how we grow. It's how our businesses grow and how we get better at what we're doing. So um, I appreciate the honesty and, and every, all the tips that, that Will offered. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah.
All right. So just to check again, because we started all the way at the bottom and none of this met your expectations, just again, show of colors. How do we, how do we do? Did we grow? Are we still at the bottom or? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, score. See, I knew do we should. Do I get shouldn't. the high five now? Or you yeah, can... yeah, Okay, yeah. finally. <laughs> All right, I, I, need to jump the, I need to dump the Spanish guy more often. Uh, all right. um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a little bit of time left. Are there any questions to me or Colleen? Oh boy, I see you, sir, and then you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, you weren't advising the Mercedes F1 team, were you? Sorry? <laughs> That's all right. That's, uh, <laughs> He's asking whether it's Mercedes or... The Spanish guy didn't hear me. Um, <laughs> You weren't advising the Mercedes F1 team, were you? No, okay. no, no, not the, not the Mercedes one. Okay. No. The real question then is, so as I understand your talk, your, your executives have come to you asking for help. How do you deal with a situation where you're in an organization already and you're trying to influence the executive who doesn't necessarily realize there's an issue and is exhibiting all those hippo behaviors? It's, it's a really good question. So how do, you, how do you talk to someone that doesn't invite you? Um, there's, so big caveat before we start, there's a really good book by, uh, by, by a professor of culture studies, Aaron Meyer, uh, called The Culture Map. Um, before you do any of that, read that first, because what I'm about to say to you is very culturally dependent. Um, start with step three. I have literally sat down with people that don't know me, who I know are in an executive position, and I, and I basically just, just put it out there. Someone isn't telling you about this terrible thing that is going on in the company. Um, and they'll look at you very, very funny. And I can tell you that works 80% of the time in Dutch organizations, or if you're a Dutch coach, because people expect you to do those things. Um, so it's, it's starting with the pain, right? <laughs> um, now that, that may completely backfire to you in other organizations, but, um, I do find that telling them something that they, sus that they need to hear that, it, that you think no one is telling them can be a really good starting point for building a relationship because they'll want to, they'll want to know more or they'll immediately fire you. And in the latter case, that's good because then you can't do anything in that company anyway. So, I would say data. That's always what I'm looking for, right? Is is show me, right? And show me where we were, what's where we're going, what's broken. Um, so the more that conversation can be anchored in some evidence, I think it's going to get action quicker, even if it is bad news, right? And it gives you a way to understand and quantify the size of the problem. Like how ba how bad is this? Yeah. How how quickly do we need to react? Right. So. so are you happy with the answer, sir? Agreed. All right, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, you, ma'am. In the example you gave of the Dutch exec, what actually happened afterwards? Because it's great to say you wanted feedback. Did he actually get it and was it honest? Oh, he didn't talk to me for a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then he indeed got, got back to me. Uh, and, and he said, um, he, he basically said, okay, without restructuring the whole organization, right? How do I actually, um, how do I actually allow for people to take accountability of the whole thing, right? Or well, more specifically, his his words were: if the developers knew that it wasn't good for release, then how do I create an environment where they can then stop that release? Um, and we and we talked about we talked about that. Um, and we um, and we we talked about we talked about that fear that they had that they had expressed, but that was a month of silence. Um, I've to to the point I just made. I've also gotten the boot from those from those conversations, um, and that's that's hard at the moment, um, but ultimately. Um, I've, I've found there's, there's kind of two, two kinds of people. There's, 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 there's the people that can't get that feedback going and there's the people that don't want that feedback going. And unfortunately, and this is, this is a whole different kind of presentation, but you are likely at an executive level, more likely than normal to meet someone that is on the 
sociopathic spectrum or has some sort of narcissism. <laughs> That's unfortunately the truth. That and doctors. Doctors are the worst. Surgeons. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, there are people that don't want to hear what is going on, right? And that the the pain, uh, bringing the pain. Oh, that sounds mean, right? But that's kind of a bit <laughs> of a test. It's a bit of a test. Yeah. So how do the developers actually give the feedback to the execs? Do they go and sit down with them, have coffee with them, do they fill in questionnaires, retros? I uh, I had them sit down for lunch, okay. and and basically put the fish on the table, as they said. If you, know, you knew it was garbage. You felt you had to release it. He says you would have been free to not do that. Um, let's talk about where it went wrong and how we can make that explicit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting I'm getting very angry faces from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great sample. And thank you once again, Colleen, yeah. for saving me. <laughs> nice job, even though you both said my high five.